Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Toby Rates from the Autism Society of Oregon. Um, we are getting ready to start our uh, broadcast of Understanding Developmental Disability Services in Oregon for transition age people and for adults. A um, couple of housekeeping things first. It's just about 12 noon, so I'm going to start chatting for just a few minutes as, as we get everyone to join in. Um, I want to say that we will not Everyone is on mute except for the presenters. If you have questions, please put them either in the chat box or in the Q&A. And we will address questions at the end. We'll leave time for that. Um, <laughs> if you hear clapping in the background, that's my son, Jacob. Um, but um, if there is a question that just needs a little bit of clarification, Lori Ball is going to be our tech person, and she will break in and make sure that we make any um, clarifications as we go along. We also have a poll for people to complete. Please don't leave without doing out that. Doing that is just to give us some feedback and, and what's been helpful and what else you'd like to see. That will be at the end. Um, also, the slides will be sent out by email. We're happy to send those out in case you don't get everything because it is lots of dense material. Um, and this webinar is being recorded, so it'll be recorded and it will be placed on our website um, for future viewing. And finally, we will be talking a lot of acronyms here, and there will also be a number of links mentioned. Those are all in slides at the very end of the presentation, so don't feel like you have to get this all down. Okay, it's now 12.01, so we'll go ahead and get started on the webinar. As I said, this is the Autism Society of Oregon. And we're presenting Understanding Developmental Disability Services in Oregon for transition age kids and for adults. As a little bit of background, the Autism Society of Oregon is a nonprofit organization. We provide resources, education, advocacy, and support for everyone who's impacted by autism. That's throughout the state of Oregon, throughout the lifespan, and throughout the autism spectrum. We don't charge for our services and we don't have any membership fees, so please contact us with any questions. We're happy to help in any way we can. So, hopefully, I can get to the next slide. Uh oh, I'm trying to figure this out. <laughs> the next slide is going to be presenting who we are. Okay, Lori, can you help me out with any of this? <laughs> Why my screen isn't going to the next one? Hmm. <clears throat> I'm going to stop share for a second and then go back to it. Maybe that's what it needs. And move down. Oh, this is awful. I'm sorry. Let's try a different screen share. Do you want me to just go ahead and introduce myself? Yeah. Go okay. ahead and introduce yourself, Kim, while I try and figure this out. Okay. okay. So this is the prettiest show, but <laughs> go I'm ahead. Kim Goldman. I'm Kim Goldman, and I am a board member of, with the ASO. I am a former service coordinator for 24 years at Multnomah County, and I currently am an Oregon Needs Assessor at Multnomah County. And I'm Toby Rates. That is a much better picture of me than I look right now, but I'm Executive Director of the Autism Society of Oregon. And I am the mom of two children who both access developmental disability services. Um, one is now age 20, the other is 16, so he's gonna be heading into transition services soon. They do both access services through Multnomah County. This presentation is based on statewide services. So our experiences are specific to Multnomah County, but um, we, everything should work statewide as well. So this is a statewide presentation. Our next slide, this is just a flow chart to give you a sense of where things are and how they work in the state of Oregon. At the top of the organizational flow chart is DHS, that's Department of Human Services. Underneath the Department of Human Services, 
there is the Department of Child Welfare. There is what's called, the acronym is ODDS, which stands for Office of Developmental Disability Services. Everyone really knows it as DD Services, and that's what we're going to be calling it today. A separate agency also under the Department of Human Services is Vocational Rehabilitation Services. And those can often work in conjunction with DD Services, but they are a separate agency, separate eligibility requirements. And then we also have Aging and People with Disabilities. Um, autism falls within ODDS, so that's what we're going to be concentrating on. Um, underneath DD Services are both your local offices, which the technical acronym for that is CDDP. That means Community Developmental Disabilities Program. Everyone knows this is simply your county services. And then there are also support services brokerages, which are specifically for adults. They essentially provide the same services as the county offices, but they are private organizations. And we're going to go into more detail about the differences there. But for right now, just think of the, both your local county offices and the brokerages as providing pretty much the same services, but well, one's a private entity and one's a public entity. So now we're going to be talking first about navigating the process of obtaining developmental disability services, how you apply and what eligibility requirements there are. And I'll turn it to Kim for this slide. Okay, so step one, referral and application process. In the adult world, anybody can refer an adult. Um, the adult must be a U.S. citizen or a qualified non-citizen. We're not going to get into that here, but you can always talk to the intake or eligibility specialist about the qualified non-citizen part. <clears throat> there is no cost to apply, and the adult the person that's being referred, the adult with the disability, does need to sign the application. Um, any kind of signature is fine, and X is fine. Um, applications are available online at the local DD services office, and they are in English, Spanish, Russian, and Vietnamese. And at the end of this presentation, there will be links to that application. There will be links both to the local offices and to the application. It's the same application for children, for adults, it's, and no matter what county you're in. So it's nice that it's one size fits all. One quick note on the application is that where it says applicant, that, does, that means the person who experiences disability, if, even if someone is applying on their behalf, if you're a parent on behalf of your adult child, for example, filling it out, the applicant is still that adult child, not you. And that, that's one thing that tends to be confusing. The rest of it is, is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, eligibility timeline. So you've applied and eligibility has nine, the eligibility team has 90 days from when the application and all the release of informations are received to determine eligibility. Um, extensions may be requested and often are. So keep that in mind. Um, you will receive notification that a about your eligibility from the eligibility team, um, whether denied or applied or approved, you'll receive notification. Um, if you don't def if you don't hear back from DD services, definitely call them. Call, email, the intake specialist. Um, again, there's links at the end of this. And as Toby likes to say, polite persistence, because it's a big, huge system. Things can get shuffled and lost. So if you don't hear and it's been 90 days, definitely follow up. There was a quick question about whether someone asked if they could download the slides. You're welcome to download them if you know how to do that. That's fine with us. We will send them out by email though. And next slide. There we go. Um, step two, looking at the eligibility determination. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. You must have a medical diagnosis to apply for developmental disability services. This, we're talking mainly about developmental disabilities or what's called DD, um, but also people can apply under intellectual disability. And we're going to go into the differences there. But 
whether it's um, under intellectual disability or developmental disability, you must have a medical diagnosis in order to qualify for developmental disability services. And educational identification, what you get at school in order to get an IEP, that's not gonna be enough in and of itself. So the quick rule of thumb is that if a doctor did it, good. If the school did it, it's probably not enough. There is a, a slight caveat on that, is that sometimes, this is fairly rare in my understanding, but if a doctor, if a doctor completes a medical statement as part of the IEP eligibility process, then the school diagnosis can be accepted as a medical. It, it's kind of unusual. I also like to make sure people know ADHD or ADD by itself does not qualify for developmental disability services. It can be, you know, you can have an autism diagnosis and a co-diagnosis of ADHD, and that's fine. But by itself, ADHD and ADD do not qualify as diagnoses for developmental disability services. Now, if you don't have a medical diagnosis, AD services may, and I want to emphasize may, be able to help with getting that. It's going to depend on a review of the records, um, and they really wanted us to say it's, it's not guaranteed. But it's, it's the way, what I want to emphasize on that is that if you don't have a medical diagnosis, go ahead and, and apply anyhow. If you're having a, you know, if you have a long wait, you won't be able to get medical evaluation, go ahead and apply and see if ED services can help you with that. I can't have a long time with that because it's a free application. There is no income limit for eligibility. Um, this is unlike SSI or SSDI, which has a very strict income limit. So there's no income limit, but the caveat is services are very limited if you don't qualify for OHP, which is our version of Medicaid. Medicaid, of course, is based on income. There's some waivers available that we're going to discuss later, but if you already have OHP, it's going to um, give you a leg up in terms of being able to qualify for services that were actually useful. Um, and not having to go through the waiver process. Also, so like I said, you know, what is the point of applying for DD services as an adult if you're not eligible for OHP? The main thing is, is that you will at least be in the system. Um, if there are, are any changes to eligibility or if new services become available. Um, for example, my kids were in DD services before K-Plan. There were really no services available, but K-Plan came sort of out of the blue in about 2012, and all of a sudden they did have access to services. Since they were already in the system, we didn't have to go through that process. And also there can be changes in an adult's needs as time goes on, and they may qualify for OHB. Also, you can receive some support with navigating vocational rehabilitation services for employment including if you're eligible for DD services, you're going to be eligible for voc rehab and also for navigating that process. As I said, there is a waiver available for adults to be eligible for OHP if they qualify for developmental disability services and a much higher income. Um, it can go up to 300% of the federal poverty level, which is an annual income of $38,000 for a single adult in 2020. So that is a pretty high income at which to access OHP. So the bottom line is, even if you don't qualify for OHP currently, give it a shot, you may be able to also get into the waiver. And then this difference is between eligibility criteria for both intellectual disability and developmental disability. The biggest factor is that for intellectual disability, IQ is important. The IQ for intellectual disability, your IQ must be tested at 75 or below. For developmental disability, IQ is not a factor. Instead of in IQ, what they look at is an adaptive assessment. That will be required. They want it, and um, we'll talk about an adaptive assessment is, but it's at their cost. For both disabilities, the disability is expected to last indefinitely. For intellectual disability, the disability must manifest by age 18, whereas for developmental disability, it has to manifest by age 22. And I'm not exactly sure what this means, but one of the criteria is that this disability originates in the brain and directly impacts the brain. So autism is included underneath that, is the main point for us. And 
Tim is going to talk more about the adaptive assessment and the manifestation. Okay, eligibility determination, the adaptive assessment and manifestation. And I, and I want to say, I want to just kind of reiterate, if you're unsure, apply because it's free um, and you don't have to worry about all this, you can just apply. But um, adaptive assessment is free through DD services. You can request your own provider, but you're gonna pay for that, that's at your own cost. And if you do that, you definitely wanna check with DD services first, either eligibility and intake, um, because there are specific requirements. So you, if you're gonna use your own person and pay, you will pay yourself and you'll wanna just talk to intake prior to that. Otherwise, it's free. And DD, DD uh, Developmental Disability Services has people that do that. Um, it, the, adapt, or the testing needs to show that there is significant adaptive impairment attributed to the disability in two areas. So the first area is what is, first, what is a significant adaptive impairment and it's kind of complicated um, and so we're not going to get into that in this webinar but you really don't even need to know that your intake specialist knows that your eligibility specialist knows that and you can get more details from them if you need to um, you can have a high IQ and low adaptive scores and a lot of times people will say oh well, we didn't apply because you know he, he's so smart and his IQ is off the chart it, it doesn't matter because they're looking at the adaptive scores also. Um, then we go to, it must manifest by age 22. So basically this means the onset needs to be during the developmental years. However, you don't have to have a diagnosis before age 22. I've also had people say, oh, well, you know, he's too old. No, you can still, you can apply at any age for DD services. Um, you may be able to use current data or testing, whatever it is you have, um, if there's evidence from the developmental years, if there's evidence that there was a, a disability going on during those years, you can you may be able to use some of that information to help with eligibility. To give a, a couple of examples here, because this is kind of dense information, um, for the manifestation before age 22, it's great if you have a diagnosis before age 22, it makes things much easier. It's not a cutoff. Um, you, you, know, you can show evidence that of um, disability through doctor's uh, records. You can show it through educational records. If you had an IEP in, in school. We have known people who, you know, their records for whatever reason from before they were age 22 are no longer accessible. Sometimes it's been too long. Um, sometimes in one case there was a fire. Um, in that case, you know, DD services can still work with you to either do some current testing because autism is not something that happens after age, you know, you're not going to have adult onset autism. If you're autistic, you've been autistic um, since birth. So, um, what we say is even if you don't have access to those records, you can sign some releases of information to give DD so they can try and access them. Or if there's just no way to access those records, then they'll, they may be able to look, do some current testing and data and qualify you that way. So don't feel like that manifestation before age 22 is a hard cutoff. Right. The other thing going back to the adaptive assessment, these are, you know, psychologists give these this testing. That's why we say it's it's complex because it's all in how they score this testing. When it's going to become important is if you get denied, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, to know how it was scored and, and what wiggle room there might be there. And as I as Kim mentioned and, and emphasized, and I just want to emphasize again, the fact that active assessment is how you work in the world around you. And it, you can have a very high IQ and you can still have low adaptive scores. So don't feel like, I just, you know, we know people who are in PhD programs who have qualified for DD services. Intelligence has nothing to do with disability. I just want to make sure that's um, emphasized. I saw yeah, someone that's asked, important. Yeah, about the waiver, and we're going to talk about that some more, and we'll also go into that if we don't cover it in enough detail questions. 
Kim, now we're talking about if you already have DD service as a child and transitioning to adult services. So you've got services, you're transitioning to adult services, and take all of this with a grain of salt as really ideally um, by age 15, 15 and a half, you should be talking about the transition, ideally. But we're going to stay safe and say by age 16, you're, uh, the child who receives DD services will be transferred to a high school transition service coordinator. So they'll no longer be with children's service coordinator. So you'll change, your service coordinator will definitely change by age 16. Um, the family will be contacted with the new high school transition service coordinator at the next annual meeting held after the student turns 18. 16. Uh, excuse me, 16. Oftentimes this happens at 15. Um, the high school transition service coordinator serves young adults and children from ages 16 to 21. And then by age 22, the adult is transferred to an adult service coordinator. And that's, that's who you have for the duration of your services. Um, again, this doesn't always go just exactly like that, but by 16, you should be transferred to a high school service uh, coordinator. Okay, transition by, okay, yep. Yeah. Are we ready? Okay. Um, occurs before age seven or nine. Oh, this is trans. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's transition to an eligibility redetermination because you are, as a child who's already in DD services, you've been determined eligible. There are two points at which you're going to have a redetermination. Right. Two times throughout your DD history that you'll have redetermination. One occurs before age seven or nine, and one occurs before age 18 or 22. Um, these are usually done about nine to 12 months before your seventh or 18th birthday um, or, or ninth or 22nd birthday. We're not quite sure what the difference there is, but that's when eligibility is done. New testing is not always required. Um, there may, they, they, they may need new testing depending on what information is already in your file um, and how current it is. So for example, if you're if your five-year-old just came into services and everything's pretty darn current and she's turning seven, it could just be, eligibility could be approved through a file review. Not always though. Um, and that then, uh, once eligibility is determined as an adult, that's it. Except, meaning that's, you're eligible as an adult. Except, and there's some very little exceptions. Um, if you leave DD services, let's say you move out of state or you just leave services for uh, more than 12 months, you're gonna have to reapply when you come back as an adult. Um, if the organ needs assessment, which you will get, um, we'll get to that. If the organ needs assessment indicates that you're, you no longer qualify for services, this is really unusual. Um, most developmental disabilities, most last a lifetime. Um, or if your current information, your medical information, your psych evals um, com conflicts with developmental disabilities determination. Really unusual, but we're putting it out there. Typically, once you're, once you're approved as an adult, you're, you're usually in. Yeah, so except for these um, And we apologize that it's a little bit weird that it, it built, you know, the age is there. We're not sure, and we couldn't get a straight answer on whether eligibility redetermination for an adult, whether it usually occurs before age 18, or some circumstances when it occurs before age 22, and we really couldn't get a good answer as to which one applies to which groups. So we just left it open and said, sometime before age 18 or before age 22, there will be an eligibility redetermination if you already have DD services. And then that's it. It's not done again unless, you know, one of these three um, things happen, two of which are very unusual, and the third is entirely dependent on the person if they need services for more than 12 months. So we hope that's clear. Next thing is denial. If eligibility is denied we strongly, strongly suggest that you go ahead and appeal that. 
The appeal information will be included with a written denial letter. Look for it's called a hearing request form. And also your local office, that CDDP. Now these are the people who've just denied you, but if you ask them for help to complete the appeal, to, to complete the hearing request form, it will help you do that. Um, sometimes it, you know, even though they've just denied you, which seems a little odd, they, they oftentimes will be happy to help because their hands are tied and, and they have to deny people that they may want to approve. Um, it will be really helpful to get more information about why the denial was made. That's when you want to ask your eligibility specialist, the person you've been in contact with, maybe set up a meeting to explain the reasons behind the denial and review any additional information you may have for them, if you have it for them. Um, this would also be a good time to have them go through that adaptive assessment and explain how you scored and why you scored that way. Um, you do have 90 days for the appeal. That is the day by which the appeal form has to be received, not postmarked. So get that in, you know, four or five days in advance at least so that you know you have time to get it there to them. You can also reapply at any time. It's free. There's no limits on how often you apply. But especially if you've had uh, new information come in, you've had a, a new testing done or whatever, go ahead and reapply. You're in the middle of an appeal, wait till the appeal is processed. But other than that, um, keep applying, things change, eligibility requirements change, it's all a moving target. So it's well worth either appealing or um, going ahead and reapplying again. Now, I'm gonna turn it back to Kim for the a happier consequence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're approved, that's awesome. So once approved, oh, what's sorry. next? <laughs> I'll go to the next slide. <laughs> okay. After you're approved for the adult system, entering the adult system, DD services, your service, connect, a service coordinator is assigned or a personal agent is assigned if, a bro if you're using a support brokerage. We'll talk about that later, um, but the brokerages are doing the same thing as service coordination with the exception of a couple things. Um, they are just private case management. Oregon needs assessment will be scheduled by an organ needs assessor and they will contact you. Um, this happens, this should happen 45 days, within 45 days of your eligibility. Um, an organ needs assessor will set up the needs assessment, which we'll get into later too. A service coordinator schedules a meeting then with you, um, with the adult, with the disability, to complete an annual service plan and individual service plan within 90 days. Of eligibility. Okay, so now we're going to talk about accessing services through the Oregon Needs Assessment. Uh, this is Oregon Needs Assessment is done, and what happens is it results in a number of hours showing what how much support is needed. Um, once the number of hours are determined. Then the individual with the disability hires a personal support worker or, again, through the brokerage. Um, what does that stand for? DSP? Direct, direct support professional. Thank you. Um, and this is the person that you hire to help work on the support needs of, the, of what, what is needed from the person with the adult with the disability. So let's just hypothetically say you score... 50 hours a month, then you hire somebody that helps you with that, and those people get paid either through the county or, or through the brokerage services. A reminder is the Oregon needs assessment is to be completed within 45 days of elgi eligibility being determined. Okay, after that, how often is the Oregon needs assessment done for an adult? A full assessment is done every five years, by age 18 and by an ONA assessor. So 18, you get one, you get your organ needs assessment and every five years after that, however, a, um, a, a full, then a ONA review or another ONA is done every single year or by the service coordinator, not the ONA assessor. Every year you'll get one um, or, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah or it can be done upon request. So let's say your needs change. Let's say 
um, something big in your life has changed and you need a new assessment, you can request an assessment be done prior to the time that it normally would be. Um, and the owner review, that, that's the one that's done just by the service coordinator, is, is the thing that is done every year, the review that's done every year. Um, My understanding is that review is, it's not a full owner assessment. It's kind of, everything's still the same? Do you need anything changed? You know, it, it's not, it's just kind of an overview. It's, a, it's an overview. Um, okay, let's see, just the next okay, slide. The next one, sorry. Yeah, here we go, okay. So let's talk about the ONA. Um, a trained assessor completes the ONA, not the service coordinator or the personal agent. Um, we always say plan for two hours. Oftentimes it doesn't take that long, um, but sometimes it can and it depends on the needs. Um, the assessor does have to see the individual with the disability. Um, it's up to them if they wanna stay for the whole assessment. Um, but once they're an adult, this, this is about them. Um, I like to say also that assessment is kind of a downer in that it's asking, tell me everything your child can't do. And the reason it's asking that is because we, we don't know them and we really wanna make sure we capture needs. Um, but if the person doesn't wanna be there throughout the whole thing, that's fine too. Um, the individual can have anybody they want at their organ needs assessment. Um, if there is a legal guardian, meaning guardianship has been paid for and is now in place and it's legal, the guardian must be there. Um, service coordinator and or personal agent is always invited, but it's up to them if they attend or their schedule. Um, it's important to get a realistic view of the individual during the organ needs assessment. So I always tell parents that uh, the state really likes to see examples in, in the needs assessments. So if, if I'm asking yes or no questions, if your assessor is asking yes or no questions, um, and you have examples of, of that, please give them, please paint the picture um, of either yourself or the adult with the disability, because it's important to see the whole picture as opposed to just yes, no, yes, no answers. Yeah, I, I just wanted to chime in that the importance of the organ needs assessment is, as you said, it's going to determine how many hours of support each month the individual qualifies for. And it's really only done every five years, except in exceptional circumstances. So this sets a lot of tone for what supports and services are going to be available to this person. Um, and it is, as Kim said, kind of a downer. It is based on what the person can't do. Um, this is not the time to brag on someone. This is the, and this is not the time to talk about how someone can function on their best day, if they've ever been able to do this. This is what life looks like day to day, what supports and help this person needs every day. Um, one good example is, you know, a question like, can they dress themselves? You know, it sounds like a yes or no answer, but the uh, uh, answer that's going to give them more information and hopefully result in the supports this person needs is to say, well, here's how it works. I pick out their clothes, they put them on themselves, I have to prompt him, you know, it's, don't forget to put on your pants or, you know, whatever it is, shoes and socks now, and, and go through the narrative, tell the story, of how it typically works, rather than just saying, oh yeah, they can dress themselves because they're able to buy. Um, that provides a much more realistic, helpful view of supports and services this person would qualify for. Yep, great example. And, and, and some examples are even more subtle. Just think of the things that you do every single day that you don't even think about, um, just to set things up for success. Um, I, I, ask somebody during an ONA about eating and if, if, you know, if the plate is in front of the individual and the silverware is there, do they eat independently? And then I dig deeper because um, the parent said, oh yeah. And then as we dug deeper, I learned that no, the, the child um, who was a young adult actually um, needs stuff cut up for him. The parents do all the cutting up. He doesn't bite things, so he wouldn't bite a sandwich. 
he, they would have to cut the sandwich up. And then he tries to eat too fast. So then there's supervision needed because then he chokes. So these are the kind of things that paint the picture. Great example. Thanks, Kim. And now the other pilot, the ISP. Okay, accessing services. You have an individual service plan every year and you have an annual service plan. I like the car because you're in the driver's seat. Um, so this must be completed. The ISP must be completed within 90 days of eligibility and then every year. It's just like, um, well, it's similar to an IEP. You'll have it every year. Individual service plan is very person-centered. It will reflect the individual's goals, dreams, hopes, um, needs. And once you're, eight, once you're 18 and no longer, once somebody is 18, they are their own legal guardian. Um, they are the adult and they make the decision unless you have obtained guardianship through the, legally through the courts. Um, so once anybody in the world is 18, they are their own guardian. They make the decisions. Um, Kind of scary. The service coordinator and PA uh, personal agent must follow the adult's wishes. So if there's no guardian, um, so the adult is their, their own guardian at 18, what they say is what needs to be heard um, above what anybody else says, if that makes sense. Oftentimes, you know, that's not easy. I will chime in again, as the parent of a 20-year-old and, and an almost 16-year-old, this can be really difficult. And at age 18, all of a sudden they're an adult and yeah. they make their own decisions, even if they're bad decisions, and you as a parent are not in charge anymore. And that can create some tension, particularly because the service coordinator or the personal agent, they do have to follow you know, the goals and, and what the young adult wants, even if you as the parent don't think it's a really good idea. So just be aware that sometimes service coordinators can be caught in the middle of that, that unless you have legal guardianship, which is through the courts, that 18 year old is an adult and they get to make those decisions. Yeah. Toby, there's a question. Is guardianship the same as conservativeship? They're slightly different. Um, guardianship refers to making decisions um, on behalf of the adult. Conservatorship is a guardian. You don't technically have control over financial matters for that uh, protected person unless you also have conservatorship. And I will say that um, the ARC has been doing some trainings and webinars on guardianship and, and alternatives to that. Um, I'm not sure if they're on their website um, as recorded, but I know they've been doing several of them and that's definitely worth looking into. Um, I would check with the ARC on that. Emily Brayman, and I'm happy to send out a link to how to contact him for more information on guardianship. So with that, I'm going to go on to, to talking more about the brokerages, um, because this, it, it's just, it's terminology that gets really confusing. As we said earlier, under developmental disability services, there are two ways to receive services. One is through your community, Developmental Disability Program, the CDDP, which are the local offices, and those folks are called service coordinators. There are also support services brokerages. People hear the term brokerage and they think, I don't need help with stocking off. <laughs> it's a ridiculous name because it's confusing. But that's, they are simply providing the same services, but as private entities, and those caseworkers are called personal agents. They're the functional equivalent of a service coordinator. We'll go into a little bit more detail here. Um, what a support service brokerage is, they are private organizations that provide the same services as county DD services with a few exceptions that we'll talk about in a minute. Each brokerage, um, most of these are nonprofits, they don't have to be though. And each brokerage serves a specific geographic area. Um, so for example, in the Portland, Eastern Oregon, for example, I think there's just one brokerage that serves that area. They also have a limit on the number of clients they can accept, so their caseloads tend to be lower. Um, we do have links at the end for information about brokerages and also for a list of brokerages statewide. For our purposes, which you all need to know, is that you can choose, at age, starting at age 18 and at any time thereafter, 
the person can choose who's receiving services whether they want to receive services through a brokerage or through county DD services. And the important thing to know about that is that is not a final decision. You can go back and forth at any time. The only limit is going to be is if the brokerage is at capacity. They tip the limit on the number of clients they can accept. But you can always just continue to use county services until there's an opening. If, for example, there's a particular brokerage that you want to do with in your area. Um, some of the other differences, we did a little chart here. As I said, under county programs, your caseworker is called a service coordinator. Under brokerages, they're called a personal agent. The county programs, they serve all children, of all ages, from child to adults, really, within their county. Um, brokerages serve starting at age 18 and older and in their specific geographic area. County programs are either state agencies or they're their designates. They've contracted certain counties with entities that, that act as a problem in their stead. Brokerages are always private organizations. As I said, they're usually nonprofit, but they don't have to be. One of the big differences, like I said, is there is no limit on the number of clients accepted. So county programs usually have a higher caseload per service coordinator. And frankly, we're looking at big budget cuts coming up, so I wouldn't be surprised if those caseloads go up. In contrast, the brokerages have a limited number of clients, and that usually results in fewer people on the caseload for each personal agent. Um, and also, county DD programs, they can provide um, effective services and housing support, which the brokerages do not. Any abuse issues that come up will be, and it, for a brokerage, will be handled by county DD services. Also, if you need housing supports, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, if you're with a brokerage, you're going to need to talk with your um, personal agent about how those can be accessed through the county. Toby, yes. So oh, there's a question. How do you evaluate the differences between available um, brokerages? Oh, I mean that is, and we, like I said, we'll have a list, and in some cases there are several to choose from. Call them up, talk to them, talk to people that you know on the different chat groups, get their input um, on who they like, um, but I think the best thing to do personally is to give them a call and say, we're, we're thinking about using your services. Can you tell me about your philosophy? How many people are on the caseloads? How do you work? You know, all those sorts of questions that you wanna know before you hire anybody. And also, like I said, word of mouth is always great. If, you, um, if you're on chat groups and talk to other uh, people about who they've worked with and who they find useful. I hope that answers the question. Okay, next, we're going to talk about K-Plan process and services. The K-Plan is the vehicle by which people are receiving services. So what is the K-Plan? K-Plan somehow stands for Community-Based Support Services. Um, and it is a program under the Affordable Care Act, which makes it a little scary because if the Affordable Care Act goes away, we don't know what happens to K-Plan. Um, that's been in place since about 2012, um, and I would be surprised if they get away with it altogether, but it's just something to keep in mind, and that's something that we advocate on a lot. Um, in order to qualify for K-Plan services, the disabled person must qualify for OHP, because these are programs, like I said, under the Affordable Care Act, they're Medicaid services. Um, typically, qualify for OHP based on income and uh, for any adult who earns less than 138% of the federal poverty level. For a single adult in 2020, that is about $17,000 a year. There is a waiver available. At, I think we talked about it a little bit later, but you're, once you're approved for services, um, if you don't have OHP, your service coordinator or personal agent can help you filling out the paperwork for the waiver. And that waiver allows the adult to qualify for OHP basically under the level that's allowed for children, which is 300% of the federal poverty level. And that's up to $38,000 for a single adult this year. Excuse me. 
most people, honestly, as adults who require DD services or who are eligible for DD services, meet the, the initial qualification. If they don't, say they still be able to, able to access that. And accessing OHP also has benefits. I and mean, even if you have private insurance, OHP can be your secondary. There's no premiums, there's no co-pays, um, and there's no out-of-pocket costs. So if your private insurance has those things, OHP can cover them for you. You also qualify for OHP as long as the provider you're seeing accepts OHP. The K plan itself provides community based supports based on the person's needs as determined by the origin needs assessment that Kim just talked about. That's why the origin needs assessment is so important. Those supports can include community inclusion supports, that's based on the number of hours that to hire a PSW, a personal support worker, or a direct support professional. I'm going to talk about that more in just a minute, as well as independent living supports. Um, you know, helping someone learn how to cook or do their own laundry, that sort of thing. Safety supports, behavior supports, communication supports, employment supports are all available in the K plan, depending on what the needs are shown under the Oregon Needs Assessment. So now, talking more about what a PSW and a DSP are. The PSW stands for Personal Support Worker. DSP is a direct support professional. The difference that I know of is that a DSP is paid to an agency while a PSW is paid directly by the county. So if you hire someone directly to be a, and they're your PSW, or for you or for your adult child, um, that person, you know, submits their paperwork, the county pays them directly, deals with the taxes, all that stuff. If you go through an agency, there are several agencies that now um, provide the service, they hire the people. You decide, it's an agency, they send you people, you decide who you want to hire, and that agency deals with the taxes, paying the person, all that stuff. Um, it's, these agencies were set up because it has been so hard to find PSWs and to help people find what are now called direct support professionals. My understanding is, is that you actually get paid more as a DSP, so it can be worthwhile the agency, the adult, meeting the goals in the individual support plan, including independent living skills and community inclusion. So that they're going to be looking at that ISP and say, okay, one of your goals is to, you know, be in the community more and, and to access public transportation. Okay, that's what we're going to be doing. <laughs> you know, we're going to be going to places and interacting with the community in a COVID healthy manner. Um, and they will spend their, their hours with the person doing that. As we said a couple times now, the owner determines the number of hours that are available each month to hire the PSW or the DSP. And then in terms, like I said, it's been really hard to find people to hire. That's been a huge problem. Um, and the agencies help with that. But basically, anyone who's over the age of 18 who passes a criminal background check can be hired as a PSW or a DSP. For adults over 18 who are 18 and older who have DD services, they can actually hire their own parents to PSWs or DSPs. That's a huge change from child services. Um, I would say there's a special case if a parent is a legal guardian, they technically can't be hired as a PSW because they're in essence hiring themselves. But you can do a workaround because where you have a third party who acts as the employer and approves the hiring. I may have jumped ahead a little bit, but I missed the second one where, so the individual receiving of services or their legal guardian is considered the employer of record of the PSW. The DD services or the brokerage, they're handling the wages, they're paying all the taxes, there's no money out of pocket, you don't have to worry about you know, filing quarterly tax returns or anything like that. You're just there as the adult or as the legal guardian. You're the one who's in charge of who's going to be working with you. Um, <clears throat> and then there are several places to, to find a PSW or a DSP. It's still not easy, but we always say, you know, talk to everyone. Anyone who's a good fit, enjoys working with this person, is really the main criteria. Do they like this person? 
Um, and if they're willing to do the background check and get hired, that's terrific. The pay is anywhere between 14 something and $17 an hour. Um, your service coordinator or your personal agent can also connect it to agencies. Um, and there's, I know there's some that are around the state like uh, Rever Grant, R-E-V-E-R. Uh, I know they're in Eastern and Southern Oregon. There's, you know, leaps and bounds and out of the box and others in the Portland metro area. Your service coordinator or your personal agent should be able to connect it to those. And then there is also the Oregon Home Commission that um, has a registry, which has been okay. Um, I think, I'm not sure how many people are using it now and it would be pretty slow to get started. And those are some places to look for PSWs and PSPs. Um, the main takeaway I went from that slide is that um, a parent can be hired be a, and paid to work with their uh, adult on the autism spectrum or who receives DD services. And even if you're the legal guardian, you can still be hired, but you're going to have the separate process of having a third party be the employer of record so that you are not technically hiring yourself. Can I just say two things? Please. Okay. One, one, because I used to get this a lot. If you're a personal support worker, you're not a county employee. Yes, the county is paying you, but you're not a county employee. And I do want to stress the, the don't worry about the taxes thing. That's always a big concern with parents. That is not, you don't have, it has nothing to do with your taxes or any of that. You don't have to do that. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add, let's see, personal support worker. Um, I, I just want to say, oftentimes families say, oh, we've been through four, you know, personal support workers. But when that good match is found, it's really, really worth it. Um, because it can be a long lasting relationship for, for the individual. And again, I want to stress the difference. Children's under 18, the parent cannot be a personal support worker. As Toby said, you, once you turn 18, the parent can become the personal support worker. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then accessing services, getting items paid. We talked about the other things that the K plan, K plan can provide, including you know behavior support, safety supports, um, so forth. The main thing on getting those paid through the K plan is it is very important to tie the item to an ISP goal. So you know, for example, if we're having sensory overload and you think a, a swing of some sort going to be helpful for that and that is in the ISP that one of the goals is emotional regulation um, that you, know, you want to say we, we, we're looking to purchase this swing because it's going to help this person with their emotional regulation so tie that item to an ISP goal you will need a medical professional's authorization it's usually not too hard to get from your doctor just to say yes this person would you know would require a swing in order to help manage emotional regulation. You will then need to have your insurance or OHP deny it because K plan being a Medicaid program is what's called the payer of last resort. Everyone else has to say no. Um, once again, you know, your doctor's office can often help with that and go ahead and you submit that to get the denial. Um, and you submit that denial you know, with your service coordinator and your personal agent who is helping you through this process. Then they have to approve it through their agencies and it's going to likely take three to six months before you actually see the item that you requested it is also very helpful if you can say this is exactly the swing i want here's the link you know because then they don't have to go looking for it you know exactly what they're looking for some of the examples of things you might be asking for would be you know for example an ipad or computer um, whether it's to help with executive functioning or it's a communication device. It doesn't have to be a communication device, um, which some of the um, funders in, in uh, nonprofit organizations require. AD services can help, with, for example, for executive functioning and scheduling. Um, sensory items, other safety supports, whether it's locks on, uh, for windows and doors, that sort of thing. If there's anything you think would help, go ahead and ask. 
it may always be denied, but at least, you know, keep asking and find out what does work. Um, for example, we have a trampoline for our son, which is very much helped with his emotional regulation. And we wanted to get new um, safety panels. Well, DD services will not pay for that. I have found that out um, because they consider trampolines to be, um, you know, items where he could get hurt. So, okay, that's a no, but, you know, there's going to be, you know, a swing would probably be okay. So that's why I'd say just keep asking. I'm going to move on to housing supports. Okay. Accessing housing supports. So these are accessed through DD services. Um, if you receive your support through a brokerage service instead, uh, talk with your personal agent about the process. They can help you through DD. Um, it includes, this includes group homes, adult foster care homes, and the supported living. Uh, brokerages can access relief care for 14 days only. So that is not long-term. Um, as with county DD services. If you want out of home uh, services, then that's long-term with DD, not through the brokerage, 14 days only. The good news is uh, housing, accessing housing is no longer just crisis-based, which is a beautiful thing actually. And um, basically you'll talk to your service coordinator. They will present two or three options or depending what's available at the time. And um, you can then check these out and see what best suits you, what's a, what's a good match for you. Um, this typically will take a few months depending on availability. And usually more group homes are available than say foster care and supported living. Just, just throwing that out there. Not always, but oftentimes. Yeah, so I wanted to um, expand a little bit on the fact that it is going to take time and you can't always depend on availability. So while it's no longer crisis-based, it's a really good idea that if you can, try to plan ahead to say, okay, we want to look at what supported living support, you know, would be available for our, for this, you know, for our adult child. Um, and let's start looking at that, you know, several months, if not a year ahead of time, just so that you get chance to see what's available and look at what's out there because you know, when it is crisis-based your, avail your available options are going to be much more limited. But the main thing here is that accessing housing supports and having things like group homes paid for is through developmental disability services. Right. Under employment. Okay, employment types and options. So you're an adult, you're in DD services, and what are your choices for employment? Well, there is community employment. This is a paid job in the community with minimal to medium supports, such as a job coach. Um, this is accessed through voc rehab, vocational rehabilitation in conjunction with DD services. Um, and we'll get more into that later. Then there's small group employment. This is formerly, I think, used to be called supported employment. This is a paid job and it is in the community with maximum on-site supervision and support. So basically, this is several people in the community and there might be one or two supervisors per site, wherever they're working, but it is paid. And this is accessed only through DD services, not voc rehab. Um, then you have employment staff services. These are, this is a non-paid service, and this is kind of how to manage your time, workplace interactions. Um, employment path services is short-term, and it is intended to lead to paid employment. Um, also can be provided to access benefits counseling on employment income while receiving SSI, which is very complex, but yes, you can work and receive SSI. We'll just leave it there. Um, and um, talk to your service coordinator to include this part in the ISP and you can receive the benefits counseling. If you don't have DD services, talk to vocational rehab about it. You don't have to have DD services to go in to get voc rehab services. Um, and lastly, there are day supports and these are, this is non-paid 
employment. It's, it's non-paid and it's community inclusion based. So different agencies do it differently. Um, there, you basically, you go every day or two days a week, whatever you guys decide, and you go to a place and you do community activities. Um, this, this sometimes can be anything from, you know, doing art to, it just it varies widely, but you'll talk to your service coordinator about that. So clearly these types of employment are gonna depend on what's appropriate to the person, the level of supports they need, and what their interests are. Now this one is you as well, Kim, on, on voc rehab. Oh, sorry, okay. Uh, so employment, voc rehab. Okay, vocational rehabilitation is a separate agency from DD, but it helps people with disabilities find and keep appropriate employment. So voc rehab can be accessed directly by just anybody. You can go in and access voc rehab or through developmental disability services. If it's access, accessed directly, the eligibility, eligibility requirements for voc rehab are a bit easier. Um, there's no adaptive assessment, so a di diagnosis is sufficient. Um, timeline for approval of eligibility with voc rehab is 60 days. And if there's no medical diagnosis, they can help you get that medical diagnosis or evaluation for free. There's no charge, which is nice. Um, Voc rehab. So you're in voc rehab. Now they will provide a, ideally, provide a job developer and job coaching for up to 18 months. DD services will cover maintenance job coaching um, if needed after those 18 months. So let's say you get a job through voc rehab. You're at that job, you have a job coach, and but you no longer need that job coach constantly. Maybe they the job coach will pop in if a new manager takes over or your duties at work change. Maybe you'll just need a, a pop in once a week or maybe, maybe the job coach will come if um, things change drastically. Um, oftentimes if there's new bosses, that job coach can come in. Um, yeah, I think that covers that. Toby, if you had anything to add. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just wanna make sure it's clear that um, you can go through voc rehab, which is what we call vocational rehabilitation or VR. Um, you can access that directly. You don't have to go through DD services. If you also qualify for DD services, you can get some more supports with voc rehab, including additional maintenance job coaching, as well as some help navigating the voc rehab process, which can be tricky because it's a state agency. The other big thing about vocational rehabilitation services, and we say that we get this question a lot, is that if you're an adult who doesn't have a medical diagnosis, this is the one free way that we know of to go ahead and get that evaluation. Go to Voc Rehab, tell them, you know, if you're unemployed or underemployed, tell them that, you know, you want to access their services, you think you may be on the autism spectrum, but you don't have a diagnosis they will go ahead and set up that evaluation. Now, you don't have any control over who they're using for that evaluation, and of course, they have access to the report once they're paying for it. But, um, you know, DD services, as emphasized back in the beginning, they may be able to help you get an evaluation, but it's really gonna depend. Both we have will do that. They are set up to do that, but you have to tell them specifically, I think I'm autistic, but I don't have a diagnosis and to get their help with that. And just a question that comes up a lot for people. Okay. And I think Employment discovery program. This is not help finding a specific job, but rather it's, it's for helping the individual figure out more in depth what they want to do for employment. Um, this is access through DD services under the K plan. It can start while you're still in, while you're still in community transition services, which are high school based um, 18 to 21 year, year olds um, go to high school. And um, in the school system, you can still access discovery program. It's a three month long program and your service coordinator, service coordinator or personal agent 
typically gives you a couple options to pick from um, what agency will provide the discovery program for you. Um, agencies then help the person explore job options. Um, then you basically you come out with a discovery profile and you can take this to Voc Rehab. It'll kind of say what you're interested in doing, what, what, what's a good match for you to do. It is not required that you do this before Voc Rehab, but Voc Rehab loves when you walk in with this, so. And I just want to chime in again with, um, talking about the Community Transition Program, that, that is not a DD services um, no. program. It is through the school system. Basically, anyone who has an IEP who does not receive a general, ed, a regular high school diploma, they finish 12th grade, can participate in the Community Transition Program in their school district and receive services up until age 21. Um, it's usually not in the, in the high school, it could be, usually in a separate building though, and they really focus on life skills. If someone, even if they have an IEP, but they graduate with a general regular high school diploma at the end of 12th grade, they do not qualify for this program. So that's just a quick overview of it. It is through the school system, not through these services. Um, and then finally, we're gonna talk about social, Social supplemental security income, so, uh, social security programs, just because they, they, they're not through DD services again, but they can impact DD services. And I do also just want to mention before I forget that we will have a poll at the end. We're almost done. Um, and we'll be taking questions, but if you have a chance to fill out that poll before we're done, uh, before we leave here, that would be great. So, uh, social security programs, like I said, these are not part of DD services. These are federal programs that apply separately. Sometimes if you're in DD services already, your service coordinator or personal agent can help you with the application. But basically, SSI is the first one, Supplemental Security Income. This is a program that provides minimal, a minimum monthly subsistence payment to a person with a long-term disability lasting more than one year. It is minimum. Right now, I believe the most you can get is $780 per month. It's meant to provide that safety net of at least being able to pay for a place to live. These programs are based on income and asset limits, which are very strict. One thing that families need to know as your child reaches the age of 18, once they turn 18, the family income and assets no longer matter. They look only at the adult income and assets. So if, for example, like my son who is 16, he would certainly qualify based on long-term disability, but our income and asset level put him out of the range. About three to six months before he turns 18, we will go ahead and apply for him. And there is a link below where you can apply online. And so that he will be hopefully approved by age 18 to be able to start on receiving SSI. Um, if you want help with the SSI application, go ahead and ask. Like I said, um, you know, if you're already in DD services, your service coordinator or personal agent um, should be able to help you with that, but it's going to depend on their availability. I also really strongly suggest go ahead and calling Social Security and talking to them. Um, you will wait on hold or they will call you back and uh, go to the, on a day when you have some time. But the people I've talked to have actually been really, really helpful. Your, the person with a disability may be eligible for SSDI, um, which is Social Security Disability Income, um, which is often more money and fewer restrictions, but it's going to depend on the specific circumstances, and it's complicated. And as Kim said before, you definitely can be employed and still receive SSI or SSDI, but there's going to be limits there. And it gets really complex based on individual circumstances. So if you're in DD services, you're going to want to talk to the benefit counselor um, and have that on your ISP. And if you're not, if you're just going through the rehab, they can also set you up with a benefit counselor um, to explain how all that works. Because like I said, it truly gets complicated. But the bottom line is the, the federal rules have changed. They want to see people with disabilities also working at least part time if that's possible. And that's the end of the informational part. Like I said, we do have two 
uh, slides here that talk about the different acronyms used, and they're in alphabetical order. Hopefully we didn't confuse you too much with all of our different acronyms. Um, I always like to joke that I'm originally from Washington, D.C., so acronym is, you know, one of my native languages. Um, but it can be difficult for a lot, I know. And then we also have um, links here to the different things that we've talked about. For example, to access um, BD services applications and eligibility information, here's the link. Here's the link to the different local offices. You scroll down a little bit and you just search by county. Um, here's information on the support brokerages, as well as a list of the brokerages statewide. And then also the online um, application for SSI, as well as information about uh, what the uh, eligibility requirements are. And then we also have links to the Autism Society of Oregon's homepage, as well as two other webinars we've done. Um, it's long, but you can definitely you know, fast forward to the parts that might be useful. And it's actually got a lot of good information. And then we also have our Understanding BD Services for Children in Oregon, um, very similar uh, webinar that we did. And that is already on the website. And this uh, webinar is also being recorded and it will go up to the website. So with that, we thank you for sitting through this. Like I said, it is very dense and acronym heavy, um, but we're happy to take questions now and I'll uh, go to Lori to see if, uh, how she wants me to handle that. Okay, so I do have some questions. It's not a whole lot, but I do have some good questions here. Um, so I'm kind of, I was trying to butt in as we were going along, but I'm gonna start with the last one, um, the last question first, only because it's more relevant. Um, and I don't know if we can give any advice or make any suggestions for somebody who has tried to get SSI or SSDI and currently works, but was having a hard time um, getting it since they are employed. Do we have any advice on? Yeah, yeah. Um, SSDI you know, is based on development disability. Um, there are going to be income and asset limits. So if if you're over them, you might want to try talking with a benefits counselor. I'm not sure if your job is through Voc Rehab or DD Services. Um, there's also a thing called Ticket to Work, uh, which is housed in Disability Rights Oregon. And I can find the link for that and, and put it in the notes. Um, they may be able to help you with benefits counseling to figure out, you know, maybe if you work a little bit less, would you then qualify? Um, and, and look at what those asset limits are. But um, they're, you know, you want to be careful that they don't look at, well, is, uh, you know, can they work full time and they're not because they want to get SSDI? It, it gets complex. And I don't want, want to give too much personal advice other than to say, talk to a benefits counselor, talk to Social Security, or talk to um, someone at either Voc Rehab, DD Services, or this ticket to work program to get the information you need about how you might be able to access them. Any, anything to add, Kim? I'm just assuming it's that it, you're over income. That, that's my first thought was then is your, are you working, if you're working full time and you're making decent wages and I don't know what the cutoff is, but your SSI does go down the more you make. So, okay, um, there's, a, sorry, I got distracted because I was typing. Um, so there's a question about, do you need to apply for both guardianship and conservatorship or does the conservatorship encompass for all services? I don't know if I have the, the answer to that. Um, I, yeah. My understanding is that there are two different things and you need to have both if you wanna have both control over legal decisions in the protected person's life, as well as the financial decisions. But I would definitely contact the ARC about that. They have a whole program on guardianship. And if you go to the arcoregon.org, I think is their, their website, um, they would definitely contact them. They would have the answers on that. Okay, and somebody asked about resources. Um, if you go to our um, Autism Society of Oregon, page.org um, and click on resources and then there's a professional directory you can look up different professions professionals that can um, assist you in your needs so that's um, the other thing 
Oh, I'm, I'm just going to chime in for a second, Mike. We do have that resource directory, and feel free to access it. Um, there's, you know, it's like 40 different categories of, of different resources there. We do not vet them individually, so, and it's a free resource. It's free to list, free to use, but, you know, there's a disclaimer there. Please, you know, make your own um, determination about experience and education and whether this is a helpful resource to you. Um, also, you are more than welcome to contact the AXO office, whether by email or phone or text or whatever it is, and um, or on Facebook even, and we'll be happy to help you navigate that. Okay. Um, and I just want to make sure that everybody can see the poll, because I don't know if it was launched or not, but I just want to make sure um, that it was available for you to answer those questions. The other um, questions is, um, there was, I'm going to go back a little bit, too many. Um, you mentioned the um, benefits counselors. Where do you get one of those? Okay, I think we, we talked about that. It depends on what agencies you're involved with. Um, if you are involved with developmental disability services, that, as an adult, that should be on your ISP, your individual service plan, um, and which is done annually. And you know, then your service coordinator or your personal agent will set that up for you um, or, or with you. Um, if you're not in DD services, but you're using Vogue Rehab, Vogue Rehab, talk with your caseworker there about getting benefits counseling. This comes up all the time. This isn't unusual. And if you're not through either DD services or Voc Rehab, um, like I said, I know there, but are receiving SSI or SSDI, there's the ticket to the work program we should be able to give you benefit counseling on that. Because all that fails, call Social Security directly. Um, and so this is going back to the beginning of our presentation. If a guardian becomes a PSW with a third party um, for the guardian is, wait, hold on, let me reread this. Okay, I'm sorry. If a guardian becomes a PSW with a third party EOR, is the guardian is the guardian still able to advocate during ONA and ISP? I would think so, but maybe I'll send that to Kim to answer. I I would absolutely think so. Um, yeah, I think just because you're the employer of record doesn't mean you know, no, they're not the employer of record. They're now the employee. <laughs> Oh, they're now the employee, not the employee. I still think, you know, it, it's always up to the adult with the disability who comes to their ISP or not. So if they want you there, sure, I think you could still go and advocate. Um, and, and they're also the legal guardian, so they need to be there. Well, you should be there, right, right. And you, yeah, I, I don't see any problem yeah, with that. Change in your role as, as the legal guardian in any way. It's just a a mechanism so that you're not technically hiring yourself, but if you're still the legal right. guardian, you still have every right and duty to advocate for the affected person. Right. Um, and can the third party be another parent? Yes, they can. As a matter of fact, I, I know that specifically because um, some people I know, mom is the legal guardian. She is also the PSW. The dad, who is actually not the legal guardian, um, is the employer of record. Now, if dad were to be also be legal guardian, mom can't then turn around and hire him because she's technically dad's employee. So that gets a little complex. But the short answer is yes, you can have one parent be a legal guardian in PSW and the other parent be the employer of record. Okay. And if you are on OHP, are you automatically eligible for K plan? I believe the answer is yes. Is there any circumstances you can think of, Kim, where you would not be eligible for KPN if you're on OHP and, of course, have been approved for services, for DD services? I can't. No, I can't. I think, yeah, if, you've, if you're eligible for OHP, then you're eligible for KPN, is my understanding. Okay. I can't think of a circumstance where you wouldn't be. Sometimes, the only thing I can think of is that we were told, after we'd been on K-Plan, um, we were told that our son's OHP was the wrong OHP. 
so then they process the waiver for it. So we continue services while they process that waiver because we screamed about it. Um, that's the only thing I can think of is if you're on some sort of a loan or waiver. Um, hmm. that, that gets, that's beyond my pay grade. I don't really, you know, if someone's telling you that you don't qualify, give us, get in contact with us because generally speaking, if you qualify for OHP, then that is the permit to qualify for telephone services. Okay, and then can you clarify what is supported living housing? Okay, well, I can I can touch on it. So basically, I don't, and I'm not sure it's called supported living anymore. But basically, um, you are an an agency. Some agency is you're living on your own, but you're in the agency's. It's it, um, let's say you're in an apartment. And an agency is checking on you um, for whatever it is you might need. So you're on your own in an apartment. However, there's agency involved. Oftentimes, there's a worker that also lives in the um, supported living apartment complex. Um, but you're checked on, basically. You whether it's you need to make sure that you know maybe they you need to make sure you're taking your meds or. Um, if you're having an issue, then an agency is the person that's responsible for checking in on you. So it sounds like this is for people who don't need 24-7 support right. and supervision, but they do need some help and support. Right. Okay. Um, and then this was um, somebody who has a son that's working without any support services for work, and he also gets developmental disability services Will this affect his DD services? No, first of all, good good for him. I mean, he just works on his own with no other supports. That's great. Um, it wouldn't affect developmental disability services at all. If he's already qualified as an adult, no, it would not affect DD services. Now, if he, if the time comes and things change and he does need some support, he should definitely be letting his you know, either his service coordinator or personal agent know about that. Yes. yes. Possibly as much in advance as possible. <laughs> if he knows a change is coming up, for example, like he's getting a promotion and he's got some concerns about being able to navigate that on his own. Just as an example. And I don't know if we can answer this question or not, um, but can Voc Rehab access any OT evaluations? I don't know that. I don't know that. Um, I would assume if the person has had an, a, an OT evaluation and wants folk rehab to have that, they can sign a release and it could be released to them. I think they're asking if the uh, VR could do an evaluation for OT. Oh, I, oh, I see. I, um, I don't know. I have to check with folk rehab on that. Okay. Um, is community transition program available to someone over the age of 18 who has not attended school? Hmm. Does not attended school. In, in what way? I guess I need a little bit more information. If they have a high school diploma or equivalent, they have the GED, for example, they're not going to be able to access the community transition program. If they got, other than a high school diploma, if they got a modified diploma, if they got an alternative diploma, um, and there's several different levels of modified diploma, then they would be able to access the community transition program. Um, they, probably need to contact their school district and find out what the requirements are. I don't know how much over 18 they are. I mean, if they're 25, no. Um, but this is a, a separate program. The reason we bring it up also is that I know a lot of families who have killed themselves to get that uh, person on spectrum so that they can get a regular high school diploma, not realizing then that that ends their education it's available to us, for example. Um, but, you know, it's not always the best decision for to get the regular high school diploma if that person could really benefit from community transition services, which, like I say, really focus on um, independent living skills. Okay. Now, what if this person is homeschooled, but they're still within that eight, they're 17, and they're within that age bracket? Talk to the school district. I mean, it, it depends, once again, on, with homeschooling, you get some sort of diploma. Um, and if they're not getting a regular high school diploma, then they should be eligible. 
I would definitely talk to the school system. I would also, I'm assuming they're in Oregon, talk to FACT Oregon, um, F-A-C-T Oregon. They are the federally funded entity that helps parents navigate the special education system. They should have a, an answer for you. Um, it's FACT, F-A-C-T, Oregon.org. Um, or the phone number, which I happen to know, is 888-988-3228. Um, they should be able to help you with that answer. Okay. And Oregon um, School District, contact them too. And then here was um, somebody who had a question about the ONA. Um, both children were approved in February for DD services and their ONA has not been scheduled yet, and they haven't been very successful in getting any um, information or any kind of um, feedback or from their service coordinator. <laughs> hmm, that's okay. not good. Both children have been, uh, were found eligible for DD services in February. Have they had, um, an ISP? Did they no. have no ISP, no ONA? No ONA, no ISP. No. What is this? What, what what county? Um, I asked that question and I don't think I or I thought I asked that question, but I don't see. Oh, um, was it Washington County? Wait, nope, that might be wrong. I don't know what county for sure. The reason that I'm asking that is because typically counties do things in a very similar way. But I am learning that some counties do not do things. And it seems like sometimes the smaller counties have different, different ways in which they do things. Um, I, if, if I were the parent, I would definitely call the service coordinator and, and say, when do we do these things? When, when do we start doing the ISP and the Oregon Needs Assessment? It doesn't look like you're getting any feedback from the um, the service coordinator, so I'm just wondering if they should reach up to a supervisor. That yes. was going to be my next thought: is yes. to say this falls to, to me. This falls under polite persistence. If you have sent emails, voicemails, I always suggest emails first of all because then it's in writing; you have a record. Um, but I would send one more email to your service coordinator and say I'm getting really frustrated. Know, my understanding is we need to have had the owner within 45 days and the ISP within 90 days. It's been since February. We're well past those deadlines. When are we expected to have this happen? Um, there's no reason to be rude. You always have to be polite, but definitely be persistent. And if you don't get a response from them once again, then go to the supervisor. If you don't know who the supervisor is, call the, the, the local number and, and ask. As a supervisor, I'm not getting a response. Um, and you have every right to do that, and you're not telling on them, you're, you're advocating for your child, or for your children in this case. If yeah, that's almost five months. And find out yeah. what's going on. So, you know, they, these are requirements. I understand um, you know, counties do things differently, but these aren't requirements that we made up. These are the state-based requirements. And they have every reason to know what's going on and why their children aren't getting the services and supports yeah. that they qualify for. If you need help doing that, once again, please feel free to contact us at the Autism Society of Oregon. I'm, I'm more than happy to draft an email. Okay. Now then, uh, I have a question about high IQ and low adaptive scores. Are those adaptive scores based on physical ability to complete those skills? Uh, are they based on physical ability? Is that what you asked? Yeah. That's what the question is, yes. Uh, no, adaptives are basically based, well, they can be, they're based on... They're activities of daily living is what they're looking at. And right. some things are going to be physically based. Can you, are you mobile? Do you, do you need supports in moving around? Which oftentimes don't apply to the people on the autism spectrum. But, other things are, you know, sure, can, can you handle money? Can you, are, are you safe by yourself? I mean, those things are not necessarily, necessarily physically based. Can you dress yourself? Can you feed yourself? Can you bathe and toilet? Those are the sorts of things that they're looking at to see. Um, and so that's going to include things like executive functioning, which is oftentimes where people who have 
high IQs are going to score low in adaptive assessments that they need supports in order to um, executive functioning is all about planning and, and being able to execute the steps to do those things in your activities of daily living. I hope that answers the question. I think that does. Um, so there's another one is what about established um, established um, assessed needs to the owner? Wait a minute, sorry, I got that wrong. What about established assessed needs the owner leaves out? Nighttime, community integration, social support, cognitive, executive functioning needs. Should we expect a cut in hours? So I hope that made sense. Uh, I, I would love to, I, can you read the list again? Of, uh -huh. of, yeah, I, I didn't quite understand, understand that. Um, what about established assessed, assessed, sorry, I can't talk today. Assessed needs the owner leaves out, like um, nighttime, community integration, social support. Sorry, I like tongue tied. Cognitive executive functioning needs. Does the owner goes out? I didn't think it did, but well, it, it, does, <laughs> it does leave out nighttime needs. Um, really? That that are captured on the ANA or CNA children's needs assessment or adult needs assessment. We don't have to worry about those because supposedly those are all going away and you were just gonna have the owner. The owner's gonna be the mother load. Um, the owner doesn't look at nighttime needs? That, that doesn't seem right. Um, there is a, no, I don't think there, there's a question about in, in the toileting section um, about the evening or a part you can mark about you know, yes, this person wears diapers in the evening or whatever, but not nighttime needs like, um, are you woken up during the evening because you you know, this person needs to be soothed or how many times in evening does this, does the individual with the disability get up because of this, this or this. Um, the owner is still a uh, work in progress. It's been changed several times and it'll change again. Um, but that's, a, that's actually a really good question because if it is gonna be the only assessment that looks at needs, um, then, then yeah, I mean, it, again, it's, it's an ever-changing document. I mean, there's weekly meetings about the ONA and what we need to change in it and what we're not capturing and what we are capturing. And, okay, that, that's really important information because I didn't realize it wasn't capturing that. What I would say is, as the person, you know, either the parent or the person who, who's uh, receiving services, when you have the owner, bring it up anyhow. Make sure that, you know, it's part of your narrative. Um, or, or just say, look, these are some of the specific issues that, he's, that this person is having, and we want to make sure it's reflected somewhere in your assessment. Um, in the meantime, that is something that we would definitely be advocating on, because that doesn't make any sense to me. It should be capturing the other things. The evening, yeah. the evening uh, issue. I think that is correct. That it doesn't specifically ask about the evening. Even if it doesn't specifically ask. I would go ahead and make sure it's mentioned and brought up and in the notes. Um, but the things like you know uh, social supports and and um, executive functioning, all of that should be captured in the. In yeah. The yeah, and I always say, I always, always, anything you're doing that you wouldn't be doing otherwise um, it, it, with a neurotypical adult child or you're the adult, at, at, ask. Definitely put it in the ONA. Um, there's huge sections for comments in the ONA, and that's where that would go. Yeah, okay. but in the meantime, we'll also be talking to these services about what this. The Why state. are not, not being captured by the owner? That, that's a huge omission in my this, Yeah, the state. It, we're talking. <laughs> so is an adaptive assessment done at any age? Well, yeah, on, when you're applying, mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, an adaptive assessment is going to be required. There may be some instances where there's sufficient information in, in what you're providing with your application. That is going to be acceptable for DD services and they don't have to do an adaptive assessment. But in my experience, pretty much everyone gets the adaptive assessment done regardless of age 
and you're applying for DD services. Okay, um, and is there a policy that can be cited to advocate for an application to get a medical evaluation covered by a county? Um, somebody helped an adult apply in Washington County who had a compelling childhood records, um, was, but was still denied even after the appeal. Even after what? The, they appealed it and they were still denied. Okay, so let me start, make sure I, under, I heard all that, that. So an adult applied for DD services, they had some records of diagnosis from when they were a child, Yes. but DD services denied them? Correct, and they're looking for a policy that can be cited to advocate for this person. Advocate for an evaluation? For the developmental disability services to be processed. You're not answering my question. So what are they looking to advocate for? They asked for this person to get developmental disability services. They were denied because they didn't have, according um, to them, not enough compelling childhood records, but they did have those childhood records. So they're looking for a policy that can cite, be cited to advocate on behalf of this person. Okay, I have a question. The, the childhood records had a, had a diagnosis. What was the diagnosis, can I ask? I don't know if this person's still here to answer that question. Let me see, I'm looking for it to see if they've answered. We, we may need to approach this question offline and, and get some more information because it sounds really specific. But there's no policy that I, maybe Kim knows of a policy. Um, they don't generally give those out to us. But, you know, definitely what the information we have right now is that they're gonna take a look at the records and they're gonna make their determination. I don't have the information on exactly how they make that determination. A little bit okay. of the scope of this uh, webinar, but we can always look into it for them. Okay, and that was actually the biggest and the last question. Oh, I'm gonna take that back. Um, I have another question. If your adult child has a mental health condition that amplifies their inability to engage in daily activities, will that affect how they look at the ONA? And will they still help meet daily needs? So, so they, they have, have, they have a co-occurring diagnosis in addition to autism yes. that yes. amplifies their needs. Go ahead, Kim, I'm sorry. No, that's exactly what I was gonna say. You're right. Uh, there's a lot of people that have dual diagnosis. So um, yeah, anything that would amplify their needs would probably, you know, the, the owner would capture that. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, almost everyone, something like 90% of people who have an autism diagnosis have a co-occurring diagnosis, and something like half of people have four or more. So right. that is not unusual. And I think in this case, once they've been approved for DD services based on their autism diagnosis, once they start looking at the needs, they look at the needs of the whole person. It, it's almost right. impossible to say, well, that need is based on ADD and we don't do ADD. Because this are the, these are the needs of the person, how to deal with the whole person. Right, the whole person. organ needs assessment is, yeah, it's not gonna separate out. Oh no, that's not a autism need, no. It, it should capture all of that. Okay, so um, here's the final, the real final question. Um, our son was diagnosed with high functioning autism in the second grade. He has DD services. He turned 18 in January and they applied for OHP and they denied him. He applied for SSI and they are saying he needs to schedule a CE appointment because it's been a while since he's seen his diagnosing doctor and they're looking to see if we have any advice and um, I think he can hold a part-time job, but not a full-time, and they live in Southern Oregon. Okay, let me make sure I got all that. He was denied OHP? Yes. And do they know why? Is his income too high? They didn't state why. Okay, that, that's surprising um, why he would be denied OHP. Maybe he's under his parents' insurance. Um, that's why. Um, but also, they tell me the second part again, please. Um, they applied for SSI and they're asking um, to schedule a CE appointment because it's been a while since he's seen his diagnosing doctor. Okay, I don't know for, what CE stands for, but I'm assuming some sort of eligibility. 
and um, they're asking for any advice. Okay, some basic advice on, on SSI. It is very, very common to have that denied on the original application, especially for autism, um, and particularly for someone who um, has diagnosis of high functioning autism. Um, the, the supports that are often very, very necessary are not always readily apparent, um, which is why I'm not crazy about the term high functioning, because it really tends to understate the support needs. Um, but what I would, you know, in terms of, I don't have much to give you for, for whatever the CE is, I assume it's some other eligibility determination or, or um, review. Um, but yeah, when, you know, don't make sure they see the person as he really is, not on his best day. Um, I wouldn't say sabotage them, but I would say if there are certain things that you do to make them functional, don't do them. Let them see the person as they truly are and how they are without the supports that they need. Um, that can be key. The other thing is, if it is denied, which like I say is very, very common, go ahead and appeal that denial um, for a number of reasons. One of which is that if it is ultimately approved, it's retroactive to the date of the initial application. So you don't wanna cut off that date and apply again. You wanna keep going with the appeal. Also, there are attorneys who will help with the appeal. Um, they are, there's a mechanism for payment for them if it is ultimately approved from that retroactive payment. So you actually have help from attorneys. They can also, you know, even talking with an attorney if it's denied and you're looking to appeal, they, you know, people who do this and we have them on our resource directory, they do this a lot and they can give you a, um, a reality check as to whether or not this is likely to be approved. I mean, Unfortunately, having an autism diagnosis doesn't automatically qualify you for services um, because you can be autistic and still be able to be self-supporting and not in need of SSI. Um, it sounds like this young man isn't and that he would need support and services as he can only work part-time, um, but that can be kind of difficult to prove. So, you know, like I said, um, definitely appeal it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to, um, in the chat, Jay, I want to just address Jay's saying, he's saying, FYI, being an adult tax dependent can result in OHP denial because they calculate based on the household income. And that makes a lot of sense, but then wouldn't the, for OHP, not SSI, but wouldn't the 300% rule come in there? Yes, that's what I was thinking too. But I think they'd have to get that waiver. Well, yeah. So they, they would look at the waiver too. Just, yeah. I mean, one way you might look at it is if being an adult tax dependent is going to make them ineligible, ineligible for OHP, that adult, you know, that the, the tax dependent, how much is that worth in, in real dollars to the family? And is it, it, would it make more sense to not claim them as a dependent so that they can act as? Excuse me, they can't act as OHP. Right, and and Jay just uh, clarified that my tax dependent is not on DD services. So there you go. So the 300% rule wouldn't apply. Now my understanding also, and it, it may be dif different for disability, but for example, my 20 year old son, we are no longer allowed to claim him as a dependent if he's not a full-time college student for at least some portion of the year, like five months of the year or something. So once right. he turned 19, we were no longer able to claim him as a dependent, regardless of how much money we give him, if he's not also a college student. Now we will, I assume for my younger son, since we will go ahead and get guardianship for him, we'll probably still be able to claim him as a dependent. But you know, if we're not, and, and therefore he would be able to act as OHP as an adult and SSI and all that, that it would be, we wouldn't claim them and those, those benefits are important to us. And that was it with the questions. So was, was, wasn't there a question? I don't know why I have this in my mind from a 48 year old man who's try, trying to get services. It was at the beginning, I think. John, somebody. Oh wait, did I hear this? Hold on. At age 48 and not realizing much success, 
um, much success in life. I've started to question why, very difficult to find help. I'm sorry, like, can you, yeah, I didn't, at age oh, sure. 48 and not realizing much success in life, I started to question why I started to wonder about Asperger's autism. Very difficult to find help. Yes, it is. Um, you know, once again, if, if you now have a diagnosis of autism um, and you need supports and services, it's not too late to, to apply for DV services. There is probably some information in, you know, in previous years showing that, you know, like I say, autism doesn't develop organically at the age of 48. It's not like, for example, a traumatic brain injury. Um, so there, you're not too old to apply for DD services. It's going to be a little bit harder, but it's not going to be impossible. Um, I also urge you to, um, to reach out to, there are uh, autistic adult groups, and sometimes it's really helpful to talk with other autistic adults. Um, there's some links on our support group pages. Um, and some other links we can put up. Um, you know, in, in just I know a lot of adults that I've spoken to who are you know, who are diagnosed late in life. It's oftentimes really a relief to know that they always knew something was different, and now to be able to have a name for it and to understand a little bit more about themselves is just a huge relief. And there was another question, kind of on those lines: in, to what extent can these various services? Um, include ongoing higher education or high education? So we can have, you know, people, you know, certainly people who are accessing college and, and higher education can still qualify for DD services yes. if, at that time, understanding the question. There are also supposed to be supports at every university and college, usually Office of Disability Services, something like that. Um, the key with those is, is that the adult has to seek them out. It's not like an elementary school where they will come to you and say, we think there's a problem or, or a concern. So the adult has to seek them out. And a lot of the services deal with accommodations. If you need a quiet place to take the exam, if you need more time in which to do the work, that sort of thing. Um, a note taker even sometimes. Um, in terms of DD services, you know, one example I can think of is an adult who is in a, a PhD program who did, you know, did qualify for DD services and was able to get some supports, things like um, a computer that they needed. Uh, what else was there, Kim? Some, some sort of... Oh, oh whiteboards to help yeah. her. She used a lot of whiteboards, organize her thoughts, and I think DD paid for that. That was years ago. Um, but you're never, yeah, if you have a question, I say apply because it, because it's free. If you, if you know, if you and feel like, what's up? Just say, and, the, and there are some supports available, you know, for this person, their yes. executive functioning and, and help they needed in order to, to complete their program, DD Services was able to, to provide some of those things for them. All As right. it's tied to an IS Fiegel. And that was the end of the questions. Great. Okay, well, thank you all. I hope you had a, you did see the poll and had a chance to fill it out. Um, like I said, we're, we're happy to send out these um, slides and we'll add some links on there too. There, for example, to get to work and some things that we discussed. Um, and this will be recorded and will be on the ASO website, oh, hopefully about a week or so. I'm, I'm just guessing there. But thank you so much for participating. Um, if you have any other questions we didn't fully answer or, or you need some more specific information, please feel free to contact the Autism Society of Oregon. Um, like I said, our, uh, our email is was in the chat box, info at autismsocietyoregon.org, or you can contact us through the website or by calling 503 Six three six one six seven six. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Thanks, Lori. Thank you for attending, folks.